Hi everyone, my name is Lisa DeFrancesco, the Water Science Educator at Regional Water Authority. Today we're going to do some science in the field. We're going to be out collecting macroinvertebrates. They're small, small creatures that live in the water and they're a good indicator of how healthy the water is. Just like if you go to the doctor and you're not feeling well, they may take a blood sample and they can tell what's going on in your body. Rivers are the same way. By looking at what's going on in the river and what lives in the river, we can tell how healthy it is. We're going to do some sampling today with something called a D-ring net. This net is held in the river this way. It's flat on the bottom and it's arched on the top. The water's going to flow through the net and you can see there's netting on the inside. So it's going to let the water pass through, but we're going to collect the creatures that live in the river. Once we have them collected, we're going to look at them back on land and see what we have. Sampling macroinvertebrates takes two people to do it properly. So I brought along my husband, Bill. We are in self-isolation together, so we don't have to worry about the six feet social distancing or any masks to do this demonstration for you. When you're doing your macroinvertebrate sampling, you want to be in a shallower, faster moving part of the river called a riffle. That oxygen gets mixed up and all the rocks that are there that are creating the riffles, that's the habitat that the macroinvertebrates live in. So Bill's going to take the net, he's going to put it right into the river, and that flat spot, the bottom of the D shape on the net, is going to go right along the river bottom. I'm standing about three feet upstream and I'm going to kick at the river bottom and the rocks to loosen the material that's on the bottom. Not only is this going to send some rocks and sediment downstream, but the critters that are stuck to them as well. You can also pick up the rocks, scrape the rocks to get anything that's living on the rocks floating downstream into our net. You want to be standing this far away from the net so the heavy rocks sink to the bottom and the smaller macroinvertebrates will drift into the net. Otherwise, you end up with a net full of sand and rocks. We're going to pick up the net, take a look, and see how much we got on our first sample. All right, we definitely got some good critters in there. We're going to bring them over to the shore, rinse them into a pan, and then repeat this process a few times. Once we've collected our sample, we have a bin here. It's white, so it makes it easy to see the macroinvertebrates. We're going to empty the net into the bin. We're going to turn it upside down, give it a shake, and then I have a spray bottle here, so we're going to spray through the screen, and we're going to get anything that might be stuck on that screen inside the net to wash off. I noticed we have something on the outside of the net, so you want to make sure you look all over. Let's turn the net over and see if there's anything still stuck inside. We got one thing here I want to get out. Perfect. Now we're going to head back into the river and collect another net full. We repeated the sampling with the D-ring net a few times in the river and emptied each collection into the white bin. If you look closely, you can see things swimming around in it. And now we need to collect those things so we can identify them. I have a couple different tools that we're going to use. We have a pipette with the end cut off so we can suck them up. And a plastic spoon for scooping. After we collect them, they're going to go into one of our plastic bug boxes. Before you put anything into the bug boxes, it's important to make sure there's water in it. These are aquatic creatures, so they need to stay in water the whole time to stay alive. When I'm using the pipette, I make sure I squeeze it first before I put it in the water. That way, when I release, the macroinvertebrate gets pulled right in and not pushed away from my pipette. Let's take a look at some of the macroinvertebrates that we put in our bug boxes and figure out what they tell us about the water quality. We found a lot of mayflies. They're distinctive with their three tails. That makes them easy to identify, and they are extremely sensitive to pollution. If there's a fair amount of pollution in the water, you're not going to find a good mayfly population. They live under rocks and rotting logs, 
and are a great indicator of water quality and clean water. They're a favorite food for many fish and other macroinvertebrates, so their presence tells us that there's a diverse range of life in the river. Caddisflies are another macroinvertebrate we found. They are also extremely sensitive to pollution and are indicators of very good water quality. Most macroinvertebrates have some form of an exoskeleton to protect them. Caddisflies don't, and this particular caddisfly uses the materials that it finds in its environment to create a case, and that acts as its exoskeleton. Not only does it provide protection, but it has the added benefit of camouflage. Because the case is made from materials in its environment, it helps the caddis fly blend in and protects it from predators. It can also make it very difficult to identify when you're out collecting them. It takes practice to be able to see these and recognize them as caddis fly cases. Scientists typically use the presence of mayflies, caddis flies, and stoneflies as indicators of very good water quality. Although we didn't find any stoneflies during our sampling today, there typically is a very good population in this section of the river. We also found net spinning caddisflies during our collection. These are only somewhat sensitive to pollution and they don't have a case or an exoskeleton. They live in fast moving water under rocks for protection and then they spin a net to catch their food which is how they got their name. Water pennies are very tricky to collect during sampling. They have flat bodies that stick to rocks. It can be really tough to get them off the rocks and into your collection net. They blend in with the rocks and they adhere fairly well. They live on the rock, eating the algae by scraping it off with their legs. But if the algae is too thick, they're not gonna be able to live on that rock. Water pennies are also extremely sensitive to pollution and indicators of very good water quality. The last macroinvertebrate that we caught today were aquatic worms. They are not very sensitive to pollution and they can live in a wide range of water conditions. Unlike other macroinvertebrates, these typically don't have gills and they just breathe through their skin. They look very similar to the worms that you find on land. All of the macroinvertebrates that we collected today, except for the aquatic worm, go through different life stages. The beginning part of their life, their nymph or larval stage, depending on the macroinvertebrate, is spent in the water. The adult stage of their life is spent out of the water and they change into very different looking organisms. The caddis fly is a large flying insect, the water penny turns into a beetle, and the mayfly turns into a delicate looking fly that only lives for a few days. There's more than one way to determine how clean the water is. We can do chemical tests like pH, nitrates, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. And that gives us a good snapshot of that moment in time, how healthy is the water. But when we look at the macroinvertebrates, the small creatures that live in the water, and are part of the food chain for everything else that lives in the water. It gives us a better long-term picture, the big picture of what's happening in the river. If this river was unhealthy, they can't just get up and leave, they're stuck here. That's why macroinvertebrates are a good indicator of how clean the water is. The types of macroinvertebrates that we found today and the quantity of each is a good indicator of high water quality. The Mill River that's flowing through Hamden is part of a healthy environment and we could determine that by looking at what lives in the water.